we are exactly in time uh, to come to the final presentation. Also about the coefficients of, uh, of friction behavior of uh, gear points and significance uh, for the meshing process and school gears. Uh, so friction also important uh, for ADL and uh, the presenter uh, is uh, Dr. Axel Baumann and he studied uh, mechanical engineering at uh, Stuttgart University uh, and uh, made also his diploma in Stuttgart uh, and uh, then he worked uh, some uh, years for Mercedes uh, and uh, now he is in charge uh, of the Department of Software Development and Application Services uh, for measuring and testing technology for drive frame components uh, at the uh, ADA in uh, Minecraft in Germany. Thank you, Professor Tendai. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. First of all, I have two questions to the audience. Who of you is dealing with engaged problems in the gearbox? Okay, thank you. Who of you wants to know how to influence the engaged problem with lubricants? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. My name is Axel Baumann and I'm a um, former research student from the Institute of Machine Components at the University of Stuttgart. This project uh, we conducted uh, together with the company Gewonik Omax, who supplied us with poly um, polymer additives in the as viscosity index improvers, Mercedes Benz and um, former Pentosil Market, which is now a sub, sub brand of Fuchs. So what I'm going to show you today is um, what is happening in the gear mesh. Um, there is certainly a coefficient of friction and we do have um, specific coefficients of friction depending on the lubricant we have in the gearbox. So here is my outline of the presentation. First of all, I'm going to show you the problem definition. What I'm looking at is not the load case of gears. I'm looking at the gear dynamics, which means we have a dynamic system during the gear mesh. Second, uh, I'm going to show you the basic principles of load, the coefficient of friction, and the sliding velocity along the line of action. This is basically what is fundamental research, also done by the FZG Institute. Then I'm going to show you our gearbox test environment, which we use for the practical measurements. We used high resolution incremental encoders to analyze the gear mesh along the line of action, which is quite tough for um, these incremental encoders. As I said before, we investigated different types of lubricants and I'm going to show you some lubricants we used, including their formulation. The basic uh, findings we did here was not variation of the viscosity, which is basically due to yeah, a loss of drag torque, so we focused on the same viscosity level and changed the lubricant structure by adding poly improvers, different additive packages. Um, to validate these coefficients of frictions, we used a mini traction machine, which is also available here at the FCG Institute. You can take a look at it. We used the same machine to analyze the friction coefficient of different gear lubricants. And then I'm going to show you the measurement results, um, which we obtained with two lubricants in, the, uh, in a test gearbox. And I'm going to close with my summary and outlook. So basic um, problem, we have vibration excitation of, component, of the components in the gear transmissions. First of all, we, we can hear sounds by holding or whistling noises caused by vibration of loaded gears. Um, this is basically um, faced with helical hearing, so this is quite good, um, good understood. We also do have so-called rattling noises, which arise from loose part vibrations of gears and synchronizer rings. So loose parts, in this case, can be the synchronizer rings, either the idler gears, which we have in um, transmissions with six speed uh, or five speeds. These unloaded components, uh, they move within their functional clearance, and when they reach 
meet their boundary conditions, they can um, arise a sound which is um, bad for a customer. Okay, just for um, short explanation, so we do have um, a speed which is not constant, which is rising um, according to a sinus curve. This is uh, due to an ICE, an internal combustion engine, which has uh, variable gas and mass forces, so the speed is not constant, it is variating between a certain amplitude, and which when we connect the powertrain or the ICE to the transmission, we, um, we induce these vibrations into the transmission, which can lead to those so-called noises or rattle noises. Another sounds we do have in gearboxes are bearing noise, and the bearings are also an essential component of structure on sound transmission to the environment. And last but not least, we have also an influence on the service life. Uh, in our investigations at the Institute, we saw broken synchronizer rings due to these um, vibrations of the ICE and also broken gear teeth. So to say the forces which we see in a gear contact uh, are determined by the forces, of course, and more or less due to the state of lubrication. So state of friction, as we saw just from Mr. Will, um, film thickness and the wear, which is also um, basically common in the gear community. So what is the normal force and the coefficient of friction and sliding velocity along the line of action? So what you can see here in the graph A, we have local relative parameters of the normal force, this is the first graph, and the coefficient of friction along the line of action, and we do have also a sliding velocity. This is strongly depending on your gear geometry, this is an example of an FZG uh, standard gear. So when we look along the line of action, we have the beginning of the gear mesh at the point A, we are walking through the line of action to the pitch point C and then we, we move to the end of the engagement of the gears to the end. So in this, along the line of action, we have a variation of the normal force on the only gear tooth. So and point B, in this case, we have a sharp rise due to single point of contact of the gear. What is happening uh, with the coefficient of friction in this case? So here are many, um, many studies undertaken. So in this case, we have a small rise in the coefficient of friction nearing to the pitch point C. We have, a, we have a zero coefficient of friction in the pitch point C, which is due to we have one only rolling in this point, and then if we move to the end of the gear meshing and we are adding a sliding component which is rising, so we have um, a higher coefficient of friction. And last but not least, the sliding velocity is uh, beginning from the beginning of the gear mesh very high, moving to the pitch point C, we have um, zero sliding velocity and moving to the end of the engagement we have a rising sliding of the velocity. So basically, within a gear contact, we do have boundary friction conditions, mixed friction or fluid friction, depending on sliding velocity and also depending on the normal gear force. Okay, here are the properties and the formulation of the gearoid exam. Uh, I have some data here on the kinematic viscosity at 100 degrees. The density of the oil is the dynamic viscosity, which is calculated with the kinematic and the density and some insights about how we formulated these experimental gear oils. <coughs> so first of all, we have uh, a standard gear oil, which is container of a poly alpha olefin, hydrocrack and uh, solvent neutral. So it's basically a, a mineral oil based. And we have another formulation with a poly alpha olefin and a hydrocrack oil. Then we have two poly alkylene glycos, which is basically an oil which is common used in warm gears, and then we have some basic oils, also hydrocrack 1 and 2, and we have 
um, synthetic mineral oil which is used in continuously variable transmissions where there is a need for a very high uh, coefficient of friction. If you can, if you look here at the viscosities, you can see there is almost the same level of viscosity, uh, except with the PAG1, we've chosen a little bit higher viscosity to show the influences um, on the uh, traction coefficient later on. So the, the formulation of the oils is written down here. I don't want to go too much into detail, but you can see there is an PAO and an HC4, which is different viscosities. We have these polyethylene glycols, which are oil soluble. And here, this um, CVT transmission oil has a cyclohexane um, chain formation, which is basically that these molecules do um, end in a very high coefficient of friction. Basically, we also added um, some common used um, extreme pressure additives, and here are the um, viscosity index improvers that dispersing. Parma, uh, which is also a common um, VE improver in gear lubricant formulation. Okay, now we come to the um, mini traction machine measurements. So we we've measured um, with all the oils at different states of um, operation. The MTM machine consists of a test chamber, which is basically a plain disc, which is rotating, and a ball, which is also driven by an electric motor. So in this, uh, we have a point contact, and in this case, you can um, adjust different speeds of the ball and the disc, so to um, simulate the gear contact along the line of action, which I showed you in the beginning. So beginning with high velocity or high sliding speeds, to zero sliding speeds and back up to high sliding speeds. So in this case, um, I'm going to show you a condition which is rolling with superimposed sliding. This is defined by a slide roll ratio of 0.5. So this case is comparable to the beginning of the gear mesh uh, in the point A or in the end of the gear mesh at the point E. So on the x-axis we have the mean rolling speed of this system and on the y-axis you can see the coefficient of friction which is obtained um, with these different oils. In this case we have the PAO oil and the polyethylene glycol oil with almost comparable viscosities. So you can see the, at the beginning here in the first um, meters per second speed ranges we have a different um, coefficient of friction with rising speed. The coefficient of friction is lowering to a um, to a very low level around 0.02 and you can see despite the same viscosity we have a different level of friction. To make the regions a bit more clearer I added here the boundary friction area which is basically um, here around 10 meters per second and we have the area of the curve in the mid mixed friction regime and with higher sliding speeds we have pure fuel fluid friction which is um, due to the ETL theory uh, basically understood. So what is the reason why we do have here different coefficients of friction? If you look at the chemical formulation, in this case we have a poly alpha olefin and hydrocrack mineral oil um, which is basically containing of these ring uh, molecules and connection the connections are very, um, yeah, very uncommon, so there are ring structures, straight uh, chains, and in comparison to that, the polyalkylene glycol oil has um, certain chains of molecules, and that's why the friction inside the lubricant is very easy, so the chains can easily um, move against each other, that's why we are resulting here in a very low range of friction. So here you can see all the oils which I just show you in the table of uh, overview. So we have different uh, types of oils. I just want to draw your attention to the M1 oil which is the 
oil suitable for continuously variable transmission. So in this case, we wanted actually a very high coefficient of friction. So as you can see, it's the case you can um, design with lubricant to um, generate a very high coefficient of friction on along the uh, mean rolling speed. There are two polyethylene glycols which are um, on a very low level of coefficient of friction and you can also differentiate here the influence of the viscosity. So the viscosity basically has an influence in the boundary and in the mixed friction area. Beginning here in the fluid friction area there is almost no more influence of the viscosity um, on the friction coefficient. Also, I want to draw your attention to the boundary condition with the HC1 and HC2 oils. So here you can also influence the coefficient of friction comparing to this ERO oil. This one contains a friction modifier which is working in the boundary friction area. So there is a wide range of um, chemistry you can add to your lubricant to influence the uh, coefficient of friction for the gear mesh and also for the clutches and for the earrings. Okay, next I want to show you the measurements we did with the, with the single stage gearbox. We um, built up this basic hardware the loop test trick with the single stage gearbox. It is available at the Institute of Machine Components at the University of Stuttgart. So the test transmission is uh, shown here. It consists of an uh, input shaft with a fixed gear uh, on, on the outside uh, output shaft we do have uh, another idler gear which is um, shiftable by a commonly used synchronizer for um, automotive transmissions and the, the bo both shafts are located with bearings in the, um, in the transmission housing and the incremental encoders are located here on the transmission input shaft on the transmission output shaft. We also measured here on this um, incremental wheel directly mounted to the idler gear. So if we um, drive the input shaft with a certain speed and add a sinus curve to the speed, um, there is a dynamic uh, situation of the gear pair which leads uh, to you know, chaotic vibrations of the idler gear and that's exactly one, what we want to measure and I'm going to show you how we did that. So when we analyze the tooth matching behavior with the rotational path deviation, um, we can state that the rotation path deviation correspond, corresponds to fluctuations that the idler gear executes around the constant rotation. Another word for this is the transmission error. There are several words but I'm going to refer here to the rotational path deviation and the rotational path deviation first of all cause deviations from the law of gearing and disrupt the, the meshing process of the meshing gear pairs. And so here is a measurement result what I wanted to show you the basic and the, to get a basic understanding. So on the x-axis we have the measuring time and on the y-axis in this case we have the angel, which is basically the transmission error or the rotational path deviation. We are calculating this by uh, taking the signal of the incremental encoder of the input shaft and uh, the signal of the incremental encoder on the output shaft. So if we sub, um, if we sub substrate these two values from each other, we get the transmission error, which is basically when we have no um, torsional vibration, which is basically around the value zero, which is obvious, so we have a load-free condition, the gears are just running through the, along the line of action, there are slightly um, or slight um, deviations from the middle value, which is due to manufacturing or um, one, uh, yeah, manufacturing, basically manufacturing errors in a very small range of um, the angel. So and if we apply um, a sinus curve to the transmission input speed, 
you can see here the input shaft is, move, is uh, moving down and up, which is basically the, the transmission input shaft is braked and then suddenly also uh, accelerated. And what is happening then in the gear mesh is that the idler gear is following this movement with a certain delay. So if we de de accelerate the transmission input shaft, the idler gear is moving into the other direction and is hitting the boundary conditions and which will lead to a, an impact. Mm -hmm. And if we further accelerate the output shaft, the, the idler gear is moved forward. So this is what you can recognize later in the, the graphics. So basically here, the blue area is the backlash, which is geometrically fixed, so there is no contact in, within the tooth backlash. And when we move in a positive direction, we have the position of the face flanks, so which is the normal working condition of a gear pair. And on the negative side, the gear flanks are in the position of the reverse flanks, so which is the opposite side. If you do an FFT of the rotational path deviation, so we have two uh, different set of gears. We have straight cut gears and helical cut gears with an same, almost same um, ratio. So when you do the FFT with the straight cut gears, you can um, see different phenomena here. So first of all, you can see both the subharmonics of the input and the output gear, which is basically also what Mr. Karaman showed us yesterday. So these are the subharmonics. And we also have some super harmonics here, which are mainly the two or third um, dimension of the eigenfrequency of the gears. So if we add a sinus curve, so if we add a vibration, you can clearly see in this case um, we have a 30 hertz um, frequency excitation. We have this designated FFT peak in this case. And if we have no um, torsional vibration, there are there is zero cuts in this case. So if we take a look compared to the helical gear, we see basically the same um, eigenfrequencies of the input and the output shaft. We see the um, 30 hertz eigenfrequency when we um, initiate that um, 30 hertz um, vibration. And this is um, a com common, or this is a good sign of that we're doing right things here. Okay, so if we compare, compare now uh, different lubricants, what is happening in this transmission error. In this case, I've chosen a designated point of 500 radians per second. On the left side, we have the mineral oil, and on the right side, we have the polyethylene glycol oil. You can see here the, um, the curves of the transmission input shaft in blue. Um, we have the red is again the transmission error or the rotational path deviation and on the second graph downstairs here we have the signal of the housing acceleration which is basically in line with impacts which are generated by the loose components within the transmission. Basically it is the idler here. So what we can see here if we de de accelerate the input shaft the idler here is moving into the, the direction of the uh, working flanks and we have a certain impact here on this side. If we accelerate the input shaft, um, the movement is back again to the uh, face flanks to the opposite direction. And if we now take this exact same measurement with a different lubricant, with the polyethylene glycol, what you can see here is um, that in this case at the boundary conditions there are no um, vibrations visible in the transmission error and also you can see on the signal of the gearbox housing there is compared to the other oil there is much less uh, vibration signal present so the gearbox is obviously uh, much less noisier than with this oil and basically the reason is um, if we add here the geometrical backlash I calculated it into radians which is 0 0.005 this area is the geometric backlash and what we can also see additionally here is that 
with these torsional vibrations, the idler gear is moving outside of this uh, torsional backlash, which means that there is an enlargement of the line of action, and there is, in these cases, there is bending or elastical bending of the meshing gear pairs, which leads to yeah, also to electro-hydrodynamical lubrication, even with um, almost no load in this case. And the PAG oil is suitable, especially in the range when we are at the gear mesh, in the beginning of the gear mesh, to reduce the coefficient of friction, that is what we saw in the MTM measurements. So in this area, the friction is very high, and so the PAG oil is certainly able to reduce friction and lead to a very low noise emission of the gearbox. In contrary, we, if we rise the um, uh, angular acceleration amplitude to 1,500 radians per second, we have a different um, view of, on the state. So this vibration is very high, as you can see here, the amplitude in this um, measurement graphs. So still we have this uh, transmission error vibration within its natural backlash, but also the backlash is in this case enlarged. And with the polyalkylene glycol, we face now here these impacts on the driving and on the coast sides, which lead in this case to a very higher um, noise emission of the transmission, which is uh, what you can see here in the down level. So obviously, depending on the vibration amplitude, there is, um, there is the point that there is no noise reduction due to the reduced friction coefficient and that's an insight or that's an, a discussion and a problem but we still don't have any solution on this. So the level of, um, of angular acceleration amplitude clearly defines the noise emission of the gearbox. Okay, to sum up, uh, I showed you the problem definition and the applied test methods. So I used the rotational path deviation between the meshing tooth pairs and between the fixed and the idle gear to get an insight into the, um, the activities or the, the phenomena which are happening along the line of action. I showed you the measurement results of the movement of the gear pairs with high resolution incremental encoders, um, especially the relative angel, which is the rotation angel of the input shaft minus the rotation, rotation angel of the output shaft. And basically what you can see here is that you actually can measure the behavior of the gear pair along the line of action. Results where um, I can confirm that we have the previously assumed periodic oscillation of the idler gear within the current torrential backlash, but if we apply a torsional vibration to the fixed gear, um, this obviously leads to deviations from the law of gearing and the geometrics are not uh, in line with the law. So there are impacts of the gear to pairs that subsequently comes into mesh, so which means if we don't have any defined definition of the tooth planks, um, these contacts uh, arise yeah, un under, uh, under no law. So we have these high tooth forces, especially in the beginning of the gear mesh, and which leads to a high housing acceleration value. As you also saw, the lubricants friction plays a major role in gear meshing, and um, I was able to show you some two oils, especially the PAO oil and the PAG oil, which lead to different gear dynamics. And so um, I just want to drive your attention to the lubricants industry, which are have a huge power regarding the gear dynamics. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you uh, for your attention. If you want to get deeper insights, I'm going to I'm going to advertise my new book here, it's Minimizing of Automotive Transmission Oils. Here I also show um, many oils or many more oils just uh, above the 
trade cup gear, that means the spur gear. Right. But when you look only to this information, the spur gear is better than the helicopter. <laughs> I'm a little bit wondering. So uh, I think you need more information about contact ratio, transverse contact right. ratio, and so on. Um, that is um, missing. Here. Right. Yeah. Right. I understand what I mean. I you know what you mean. Yes. You say, oh, helical is worse than spur uh, gear. That's not the opinion of I think of all of right. And that's not my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> but the big that's is okay. need more information about it. It could be possible, but uh, it's you need more information about the contact ratio and spur gear and, and uh, transfer. Yeah. Otherwise, you uh, it's misleading. misleading. That's right. It's right. That's absolutely right. So I'm not saying uh, straight cut gear is better regarding NVH. But when you see only the graphs, you would say it. Right. And that is wrong. The, the slide here, I just want to show you what is happening when you add a torsional vibration with this uh, amplitude. So what you can clearly see that we have, that we are able by our um, control of the input motor, we can clearly um, excel or excite the system with the 30 Hz conditions in both cases, but with at different levels, that's right. So this is the um, basic eigenfrequency what we lead into the power train. Yeah. Okay. No further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.